Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, of course, this is that time of the year when we do another Q&A, but this time, this time, it's a special edition called Doctor's Edition. So I've gotten a lot of questions from doctors about COVID, and I thought I would share many of those because many of you ask the same kind of questions. First, number, number, first question of the day, of course, comes from my sister. Did I notice the tree was dead? Yes, Janet, I noticed the tree's dead. We'll, we'll be taking care of that, we'll fix that, and we'll get back with you later. Uh, okay, so this, is, this comes from a lot of my doctor friends who've gotten actually infected. So, and, and the big issue with them is always like, uh, one of the, they're very difficult questions, like how long am I shedding a virus that's, that's viable? Because remember, the CDC came out with saying, you know, five days, stop testing, and just, you know, go back to work. Uh, and five days wearing a mask. And the reason for that was because so many people in the workforce were being out, it was not very good. But we never really answered the question, is that reasonable to do? So there've been a lot of studies looking at, at the at virus. And so there was one study that just came out in March uh, that looked at um, 56 individuals, 37 with Delta and 19 with Omicron. And they looked at viral load decay, time to negative PCR, uh, negative antigen, and then the, the time to sh uh, where they stop shedding virus that can infect. And the interesting thing, it was very similar in both groups, both the Delta and the Omicron. It was about six days. So even though we're saying five days, most of the individuals um, were uh, shedding virus up to six days. So you could argue, you know, maybe five is a little too short. Just for your own, for my, you know, for your own personal interest, I was testing myself with, uh, you know, it's always an experiment, so I was doing daily antigen capture tests, and I was positive for eight days. Uh, and there's some evidence that the antigen capture test does indicate, you know, possible uh, uh, viable virus. So there's been a, a bunch of tests that try to ask, you know, they ask that same question. There's one, one physician said, I'm testing positive after day 10. What do I do about COVID isolation? Really good question. And so there have been two or three studies that looked at this. One study that was authored by Landon et al. followed healthcare workers from the University of Chicago who had been infected and were feeling mostly better uh, and they went to get tested after five days. They found that more than half, mo over half of them still tested positive on antigen capture tests uh, and many of those were still having viable virus. There was also a study uh, from San Francisco uh, that looked at, at the number of people that were still testing positive after five days, and it was about half of them. Uh, and there's been a bunch of studies. There was a study from Harvard and MIT that showed about 25% of symptomatic people with COVID-19 uh, were still getting cultured positive viruses after eight days. So it's, it's a hard question to answer. Five days is probably a little too short, but the one thing that seems to be pretty consistent in all these studies if, you know, if the, the PCR is too sensitive. So, you know, your PCR is gonna be positive for a long time, that's not a good test. You know, it's a good test to diagnose you when you're positive in the beginning. But in terms of how long you have viable virus, being PCR positive at the end doesn't necessarily mean the virus grows. But the antigen capture test, which is, generate, which is testing for proteins, uh, is pretty good and correlates pretty well with viable virus. So if your antigen capture, you go negative, you're probably good. In fact, you're real good. If you've been infected and then you go negative, that's fine. But if you're six, seven, eight days antigen positive, most of the studies suggest you can still capture virus, so you're probably still infectious. That's not what anybody wants to hear because we all want to get out of we all want to get out as fast as possible. But the fact of the matter is, you're probably still infectious, though no question your your infectivity is waning over time. But you know, I, I think. I wore a mask for, you know, the four days afterwards because I was still antigen positive. Now I feel perfectly comfortable. I'm antigen negative. I, I don't feel like I'm infectious. Okay, uh, there was another study uh, looking at the same kind of issue that looked at um, uh, how long, uh, what are the implications for release from isolation, and there was a longitudinal study that looked at 92 positive patients. 18.5% uh, were with Delta and 81 per percent were with Omicron, and what they found was that 17 percent after full, 10 full days were still uh, culture positive. So that speaks to the same issue. Uh, you know, your isolation really should be until you're antigen negative, although in, in practice what we tell people is, you know, stay, you stay home, isolated for five days, 
wear a mask for five days. That's, that's probably a compromise to get people back to work, but it's, the data don't really support that. The data would suggest that you should probably test, do an antigen capture test. Another question from a physician, <clears throat> any data from Dr. Hotez on the Corbivax efficacy with uh, B, B, uh, B4 or 5? And, and what Dr. Hotez said was that they're making a, a version of uh, his vaccine <clears throat> that's uh, directed to BA4 and 5 uh, as he's trying to make a polyvalent vaccine. We've talked about this a lot. Single valence, in other words, just a single, uh, uh, giving single version of the spike protein probably isn't a very good strategy. Probably need at least multiple versions. Uh, he's doing a polyvalent vaccine, same way he did the other one, recombinant protein uh, with an adjuvant, but it will be polyvalent, so we'll see. Um, I think Peter and Dr. Hotez and myself, we've both been kind of frustrated. I think that uh, the current approach is okay for phase one, but we need a better approach to vaccine development. Um, so one of the, one of the uh, questions was, is, do we have a universal COVID vaccine? And the answer is no. There's been two kind of interesting approaches. One was a paper in Science that looked at a nanoparticle that, that you could put a bunch of different spike proteins on, on the nanoparticle versus just one type. Uh, the nanovax, you know, vaccine is a nanoparticle expressing one, you know, an array of one type, but you could also put an array of multiple types. That may be a way to begin to generate a more universal vaccine. And of course, the other approach is the way Bart Haynes, graduate of Baylor College of Medicine and head of the Vaccine Institute at Duke, uh, he's been taking B cells, the cells that generate antibodies, uh, from people who've been infected, and then he isolates those antibodies and looks at their ability to neutralize many, many different forms of coronavirus. And when he, f he finds a patient that has an antibody that can, that can neutralize many different coronaviruses, he takes that antibody, connects it, or uh, maps out the, the, the sequence of the protein that it actually recognizes as a very highly conserved sequence, and then uses that to generate uh, a, a new vaccine antibodies. Uh, hopefully, that'll be more universal. So, it's either the multiple versions of you know polyvalent because there's multiple individual proteins expressed, polyvalent because you have a nanoparticle with many versions of the receptor binding domain, or taking antibodies that recognize many many versions of the of, of the spike protein receptor binding domain. Is are, those are all approaches that seem reasonable in trying to come up with a, a, a second uh, version, you know, uh, 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 of to the vaccines, which we need desperately. Okay, another question from a physician. <clears throat> Can wastewater sequencing help identify upcoming variants? Really good question. Uh, we've been using it generally as a qualitative assessment of, you know, how, how much of the virome is present in wastewater. Uh, and this <clears throat> was a paper in Nature that basically uh, the, pro the problem in wastewater is you get multiple different viruses, and it's really very difficult to sort out the sequences. But this particular group came up with a, a sort of improved method to detect emerging variants. They can, it's, it's, there's programs that assemble the viruses uh, so that you can identify them. Uh, and they came up with a, an interesting way uh, to do that that allowed them to identify variants 14 days in advance of their emergence. So, very promising new strategy to use wastewater actually to identify variants. Hopefully that'll be generally uh, usable and hopefully uh, we'll be able to start doing that. Uh, another question from a, a physician. <clears throat> how, does lung, how does lung infection cause uh, brain fog? Well, really good paper in Cell came out uh, recently. And basically they, they looked at uh, uh, mice that had uh, COVID-19 infections with, uh, they were humanized mice so they could get infected. And what they showed was that with lung infection, there's this big inflammatory response that actually uh, impacts the glial, the microglial reactivity, uh, reduces oligodendrocytes and some myelination in axons, and showed a direct Im impact of pulmonary infection with uh, central nervous system neural networks. Really interesting study, which they suggest might explain uh, some of the brain fog. And then there was another study that was in brain that looked at what are the long-term neurologic complications of COVID, another question that was asked. And basically what they showed is there's widespread endothelial damage. This was a, this was a, uh, 
an autopsy study of many patients who died uh, from COVID. And what they found was a lot of, of uh, endothelial damage, the cells that line the blood vessels all throughout the brain, uh, and showed that there was, uh, because of the inflammation there, uh, much like this, the animal study, it showed there was a lot of inflammation that impacted uh, the microglia. So two interesting papers suggesting why you have neurologic complications with COVID. <clears throat> One person said, what was the overall impact of COVID on mortality in the United States? And it was really fascinating. You think, well, it's just an infectious disease. Well, in certain age groups, it has become the third leading cause of death. So in ages between 65 and 74, you see in the light blue, COVID is the third leading cause of death behind cancer and heart disease. So who would have expected that? But uh, obviously in young people, it's still accidents predominate uh, in the group 45 to 54. It's the fourth leading cause because uh, accidents still are the third leading cause. But as you get older, uh, 65 to 74, the third leading cause, and over the age of 85, the second leading cause of mortality in patients. <clears throat> Got a couple of questions from physicians act asking about uh, when, you know, if you're pregnant, when should you get vaccinated? Uh, and there was a couple of studies, one in JAMA and one in obstetrics and gynecology, both of which showed that if you get boosted in, during pregnancy, you actually get a big uh, boost in your immune globulins uh, uh, that are also transmitted to, uh, the, to the baby, the infant. So those are, those are two good studies that showed even if you get vaccinated before, go ahead and get boosted during your pregnancy because it does enhance uh, immune response both uh, in the mother as well as, the, as in the baby. Uh, there was a question from a pediatrician, one of my friends in Lufkin, said, um, you know, is long COVID a concern in children? And there was a Lancet study that showed between the ages, uh, under the age of 14, there was a lot of kids, uh, almost 15% that were having sustained long-term uh, complications. So yes, it does happen and it's a real, uh, real issue. Uh, I had <clears throat> somebody who <laughs> said, how do I get Paxlovid? Uh, it turns out you, a physician can prescribe Paxlovid uh, and you can get it. It's, it's pretty easy to get right now. It can be filled in a pharmacy. They just announced that pharmacists can now provide Paxlovid. So you don't even need a physician uh, right now. If you, if you suspect symptoms, you can call your pharmacist. You should be able to get Pax, Paxlovid. So I got, this is not from a physician, this is a friend of mine who said, um, <clears throat> I, got, I turned COVID positive and my kids told me not to take Paxlovid because uh, uh, of the rebound issue. Well, that's just nuts. I mean, you know, the rebound is, is, it happens rarely. It's in, in people who take Paxlovid very early, they clear the virus and then when they stop, it comes up a little. It doesn't come up like before, but it comes just a little bit. But the vast majority of people don't have a rebound, and Paxlovid is incredibly effective for people at high risk, people over the age of 65 and with comorbid conditions. It's very effective at keeping you out of the hospital. So if, you've, if you're sick, you get it, take Paxlovid. If you need it, if you're eligible, take Paxlovid. <laughs> Please don't sit there and go, I'm afraid of rebound. Okay. I took it, by the way. The only thing about Paxlovid, it gives you a funny taste in your mouth, but that's about it. What do you think are the chances we'll see a new variant in the fall? Pretty good. Uh, there seem to be so many other viruses going around. Is this because our immune system is weakened from mask wearing and other precautions for the last two years? Your immune system is fine. The problem is, you know, we've been wearing masks, which is very effective at preventing respiratory infections. Now we're hanging around together and pretending everything's fine. So everyone's getting not only coronavirus, but other viruses. Um, <clears throat> So coronavirus case numbers are increasing, but much of the population have been vaccinated and or had the virus. Should that mean that all cases will be mild? Well, unfortunately, no. I mean, what that means is we have a lot of herd immunity. Now, there's actually a lot of the population is immune, at least partially immune. But, you know, people are going to get infected. Uh, what's happening is the more and more it's a disease of the elder, the people who, as their immunity wanes, the, PA, the, the BA4-5 mutants are not really uh, susceptible to the immunology, the, the immune responses to the earlier ones. So combination of the waning immune uh, response and a new virus uh, makes it seem like more and more people are going to get infected. And it, they, not all will be mild. Uh, could a different variant move in that doesn't respond to existing vaccines? Yes, it already has. BA5 is a perfect example. It's exactly what happened. Uh, and there are plenty of other places in that 
in the spike protein that can mutate that could easily change the ability to, uh, of our previous immune responses uh, to neutralize it. Uh, what should we be looking for in the Texas Medical Center numbers? So I'd say hospitalizations, case numbers, and wastewater are the most important thing to give you an idea of what's going on in your community. Um, this, is a, this is a couple of interesting. My daughter tested positive at sleepaway camp on Monday and had to come home. The PCR test we had done on Monday evening came back positive. Her symptoms began on Thursday. She's fully vaccinated boosted, and we are double boosted. She's been isolating in a room. Um, <clears throat> Assuming tomorrow's home test comes back negative, does that mean she's in the clear and can sit with us maskless? The answer is yes. That's what I was saying earlier. If she's antigen negative, that means she's probably not infectious. Uh, are there any credited paper studies on the severity of BA5? Hospitals are filling up again. I just had a lung wedge resection five weeks ago. I've been home for five weeks and families all masking went out of house. Just a wee bit nervous with a healing lung. I don't blame him for being nervous. What can you do? Uh, you know, we, it's a problem. Uh, you're doing the best you can. <clears throat> you know, have everybody, have everybody masked. And then if you do get it, be sure to take Paxson. That's enough for this week. <laughs> I'm exhausted from the, that's a lot of questions, by the way. A lot of questions from my colleagues, uh, as well as from my sister about the dead tree. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.